So what that means then is that you need to drink plenty of coffee, and if it is helpful, I have printed off an outline of my sermon that will be in the North Act. So as you go in, if you want to grab a copy so you can follow along and, uh, and drink lots of coffee to, uh, to make it through the sermon. So just so you know, that, that was my announcement today. Um, are there any of the other announcements that we need to bring forward? All right. Well, I don't want to take any more of his time, and uh, and so I turn it over to Dr. Kane. Thank you very much for your gift of offering these great lessons for us. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Thanks. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> if you were one of my teams getting ready to play a game, and I said, let's go out there, he said, oh, <laughs> so we'll try it again. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I love it. I love it. I wasn't sure this morning whether to come to the church and prepare for this presentation or to start building an ark. <laughs> as the rain kept coming down as you arrived at First Pres this morning, or has it somewhat abated? <laughs> kind of a little bit. Yeah, I kind of got saturated as I ran to the car this morning. Well, where are we in our series? Not even quite halfway done at this point, really. I didn't say half-baked, I said we're not quite half done. Our first time together, we talked about the Holocaust, the events that precipitated the event. We also talked about heroes of the Holocaust. And by the way, Tamara has so kindly put these things on the church website that if you miss something, like the presentation at uh, down at Montague's, you ought to be able to get those on online. And then, let's see, then the last time we were together we talked about anti-Semitism, the longest hatred. And, and that was rather difficult for me to talk about because a lot of things have contributed to anti-Semitism and sometimes our own Christian tradition and our church, of which we are members, that is Church with a capital C, has contributed to that. In fact, Hitler used Christianity as a way of trying to get some public sentiment negatively expressed toward the Jews. He didn't like Christianity. He said it was a religion for the weak. Because why? Well, we forgive 70 times 7 and we go the second mile and we give up our cloak as well as our coat, right? And so he thought that was for weak people, but he was willing to use it in order to foster some anti-Jewish sentiments, and so he, he used it. He did not follow it, even though he was a baptized Roman Catholic. And then, today, we're going to talk a bit about uh, the perpetrators. I don't have time to talk about all the perpetrators because, oh my goodness, there was a concerted effort, a lot of collaboration, a lot of cohesion across the society so that you had some clergy, you had university professors, you had attorneys, you had doctors, you had common folks that all were united in what Hitler was 
up to. That doesn't mean everybody was a member of the Nazi party. You and I talked about that a week or so ago. But there was enough of a majority, and Hitler was just um, smart enough to be able to tap that and use it to further his ends. So this morning we'll talk a bit about the perpetrators. And what I'll probably have to do, because there are so many things to share about each one of these henchmen, that if I'm not careful, I'm going to use more than the time that is available. So I've got an outline on each one of these persons that I want to share, and a couple quotes that I want to get exactly right. So I may, uh, you're not scaring me, but I may have to go back this way a little bit behind, behind there. And then next Wednesday, we're going to talk about the role of the church, both in terms of the church's defiance, because there were instances of that, but also at times the church's compliance, where the church simply supported Hitler. And I'll try to talk about the, re the reasons why that was indeed uh, the case. Then the next Wednesday night, we're going to talk about why resist? But why did folks, not, not enough, but certainly a number, why did they resist? Why did they put their lives, their families' lives, their communities' lives on the line to rescue and save Jews? There's been a lot of work done on that very topic, and I'm going to share the results of that particular research. Then our last occasion together, lessons to be learned. Lessons to be learned. How should Christians respond to what we have studied together? In addition, I'm pleased that Lander University has invited me to a lecture this coming Thursday at 3.30 in room 300 of the Carnell, did I pronounce that correctly? The Car close enough, the Carnell Center, and that's going to be on the day before International Holocaust Remembrance Day is celebrated, and I'll talk a little about to remember the event and some ways of responding. And speaking of these series, there's also the exhibit that you see, 32 panels that will illuminate for you the story of Van Frank, which is a way of taking all of these statistics and a lot of these kinds of events and, and, and rooting them in an incarnational way in a person. Right? So if you know the story of Anna Frank, and maybe you read the diary, maybe you could read the diary, maybe you need to read the diary again, the story is nicely put out here in this exhibit from the University of South Carolina. And a, an exhibit that Brad Christie and I put together, I hauled it over from, <laughs> from Columbia, and I grabbed Brad and, 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 and torturously uh, forced him to help me put this together. So three hours later, we kind of had this all assembled. And that prompts me to say one more thing before we officially start, and that is, I really am grateful to all the staff here at First Press for their willingness to say, okay, let's address a tough topic. One that's not easy to wrap our minds around, and the events of which and the images of which are very difficult to see. So what I've not done in any of these presentations, I've not put any of the photos of the prisoners, the stacked bodies that were gassed but not yet cremated. I've not put up any photos that different armies took pictures of when they liberated the camps. Because I'm a wimp. And that's just too hard for me to see. And if it's hard for me to see, then I think it would be hard for you. And that also takes away, then, from being able to deal with some of these things, both intellectually and emotionally. The internet is replete with images at which you can look. And if you want to get a sense of the brutality and the extent of the brutality, you can find pictures about that online. So, Long introduction. Now we need to move rather quickly. The perpetrators. 
who they were, and why they did it. Perpetrator number one, right? Adolf Hitler, Adolf Hitler, a person who tried to volunteer for the Austrian army as a young person and was found to be physically unfit. He then emigrated to Germany and signed up with the German army and advanced to the level in World War I of a corporal. He actually received an Iron Cross during the First World War. He served as a kind of message bearer from the front lines to the back leadership back to the front lines. So Adolf Hitler. So many things to share about him. I, I, I'm going to confine myself to my outline because if I don't, we'll, we'll only deal with Hitler in the time that we have, and we have to deal with some very significant people. I guess I want to say to you that he was a vegetarian, didn't like cigarette smoke, didn't drink alcohol, loved animals, had a German shepherd whose name was Blondie. His niece moved in with him to assist him in running his household in Munich, and it appears that they had an affair. And it is very clear that he was such a controlling personality and got so very jealous when she would see other persons. And in fact, there was even a rumor of an engagement that the pressure he put on her was so extreme and so extensive that she committed suicide. Here's Hitler in World War I. On the left, you can see him on the right. The dog is in front of him. He has a mustache there on the right. And here he is practicing his speeches. And he practiced them long and hard. He was a very good orator. The gestures that he made were all carefully calculated. The rise in the decibel level of his voice was all planned out. In his life, his physician, whose name, by the way, was Theodore Morrill, diagnosed him with Parkinson's disease. So Hitler did indeed suffer from disease. In addition to that, he was a hypochondriac. So the medical records that have been released somewhat recently indicate that he was always taking some kind of cocktail of mixed medicines. He stayed in bed until 11 o'clock, stayed up very, very late at night. His brand of anti-Semitism, we could perhaps call redemptive anti-Semitism. And what I mean by that is, he believed that by getting rid of the Jews, Germany would be redeemed. Redeemed from what? redeemed from each and every problem that the nation suffered. As I said before, he considered Christianity, into which he'd been baptized as a Roman Catholic, as a religion for the weak, but he was willing to use it for his purposes. His thoughts about democracy were such that democracy really got in the way of what great men wanted to do. So he was not a pro-democracy person. And at least historically, normally for ill, dictators get things done because there are no checks and balances. And so Hitler certainly was both a dictator and a demagogue. What is a demagogue? Someone who does not appeal to the rational disposition of the people, but simply plays upon their prejudices, emotional reactions, and also their fears. I should also mention Ava Brown, who was his girlfriend. She worked in a photography shop, and he met her there. 
and they started courting. He seldom was seen with her in public because he told everybody that Germany was his mistress, that he was married to Germany, and everything he did was to benefit the fatherland. So his liaisons with her were always in secret. And there you can see him with his dog, Blondie. Second person I would mention to you, Joseph Goebbels, was a bright, head of the class kind of person. Uh, he was not tall. He did not fulfill the high perspective of what a chief exemplar of the Aryan race would look like, right? He'd be 6'4", blonde hair, blue eyes, athletic, fit. Goebbels was 5'5", and his right foot was, unfortunately, due to a congenital disorder, turned inward. So he had to use a leg brace, and he limped. S certainly not an example of the kind of person that he thought he valued as being the best of the Aryan race and the best of the Germans. He had a PhD from the University of Heidelberg in the study of language, and he wrote not one, not two, not five, not twelve, but fourteen books. He actually considered and was encouraged by his parents to become a Catholic priest. One can only shudder at that proposition. Hitler then made him the head of propaganda. And he was very, very good at it. Very, very good at it. And he also was a person who planned some of those large Nuremberg rallies that you've seen pictures of, where there were tens of thousands of people in attendance. Those kind of gigantic and extravagant uh, celebrations of Nazi power and Nazi policy were orchestrated by Joseph Goebbels. Probably something that few people know is that when he was young, he fell in love with a woman who was half Jewish. And for five years, they had a courtship and relationship, but it didn't work out. He would marry Magda, as you see in the center there, and Magda had a son from a previous marriage to a German industrialist, and he's been actually placed into the photograph. <laughs> this, the photograph was originally Magda and Josef and their six children. His son, Harald, at the top, they, they kind of imposed that into the picture. But he was Joseph Goebbels' Half son, step son, and he actually survived the war. However, Goebbels and his wife Magda, who were committed Nazis, that Goebbels at one point wrote in his diary, I love you, A.H. I love you, Adolf Hitler. So when it came down to the very end, when it looked that the war was not going to be possibly won, things were terrible. Magda and Yosef poisoned the six children and then had some of the guards there shoot them. Yeah. Yeah. I can say more I want. doing it to me like it did a couple of weeks ago. Somewhere we help us out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Professor Gardner can fix it again for me the way he did to the a couple of weeks ago. Can you hit that again, see the link and go forward? No, it just froze up. As I said a couple of weeks ago, this is not an act of God. Okay, okay. I want to 
want to talk a bit about Heinrich Himmler. Okay. Yeah, let's, just, let, let's deal with, with Himmler. Probably only second to Hitler in terms of power in the country was Heinrich Himmler. Devout Roman Catholic, went to Mass, good at his schoolwork, suffered from poor health, not very good athletically, a chicken farmer who became, quote unquote, the architect of genocide. Well, what did Himmler do? Well, the first things he did was that he formed what were called the Einsatzgruppen units, which followed German soldiers into enemy territory. And once those areas were subdued, uh, Jews and other undesirables were rounded up and these persons were systematically killed. That was called the Einsatzgruppe. He also built the concentration camps. He was the head of the SS, that is the uh, Schutzstaffel, which was a special, it started out as a special bodyguard unit to Hitler, but it grew from being a few hundred persons to being a, really a couple hundred thousand persons. So they ran the camps. He also ran the uh, secret police, the Gestapo. He didn't found the Gestapo, but he indeed ran the Gestapo. And when he realized that the war was not going well at the end, he committed suicide. What he had tried to do, he had tried to negotiate without Hitler's knowledge and without Hitler's approval and support, a separate peace with the British. And the British had arrested him and he committed suicide uh, in May of 1945. I want to say a few words about Hermann Goring, who was the person who originally founded or established uh, the Gestapo that Himmler would eventually be in charge of. He was a World War I hero. He was an ace. He was in with the famous uh, Baron von Richthofen, who was probably Germany's greatest ace, the Red Baron, if you will. I see you nodding because you remember that particular squadron. Had 22 kills and therefore was uh, an ace. In 1936, Hitler appointed him the head of the four-year plan which was Hitler's secret plan to get Germany ready for war. So 1936 to 1940, he ran back. He would eventually commit suicide before his determined execution date. Here you see him at the Nuremberg trials of 1946. He, of course, is in the center. One thing that a lot of persons do not know about him is that his mom had a Jewish lover, and his name was Hermann Ritter von Eppenstein, who not only was his mother's Jewish lover, but also a godfather to Hermann Goring. He just say something also quickly about Adolf Eichmann, who was the person who really orchestrated the transportation of Jews from collection centers to the camps. And one of the reasons why I needed to be behind this piece of paper is there's a quote I want to share with you that I wanted to get exactly correct. What he said was, I would leap laughing into the grave because the feeling that I have five million people on my conscience would be a source of extraordinary satisfaction. When he was apprehended, he, well, first off, he was able to escape to South America. And he lived there in Buenos Aires, finally. And he was tracked down and arrested by Mossad. That is the secret, uh, I shouldn't call him secret, the uh, uh, intelligence police of uh, Israel and uh, brought back to Jerusalem to stand trial 
and he was indeed found guilty and hanged. But his last words were to say, I was only following orders. I was only following orders. I'll be Jewish and say it three times. I was only following orders. You can think about the ethical ramifications of that. I was just following orders. And he also said, as he was, uh, they were preparing to hang him, he said, uh, long live Germany, I die a strong believer in God. A few other people I need to comment about, and I want to leave some time for us to talk about this because the discussion we have and the questions that you raise are even more important to me than the information that I'm sharing. You all know me well enough to have come to that realization. Joseph Mengele, he was a medical doctor. He was in charge of the medical aspects of Auschwitz concentration camp in uh, Poland. He was the one when they dropped off people at the uh, entrance to the camp, he said right or left. And those who went to the left uh, lived and had barbarous kinds of situations. The other persons were immediately gassed. He worked especially on twins. And so he injected twins with different kinds of uh, microbes to give them diseases. Like one twin would be spared, the other twin would not, and they'd try to see what the differences in reactions were. Uh, he also injected them with things like uh, formaldehyde and other things to see what the results would be. Uh, he also wondered how long an airman could live who had parachuted from a plane in the cold waters of the uh, Atlantic. And so he would put persons into the water for interminably long periods of time just to see how long they were able to live. And if he did it with twins then, there was no control person with the twins, now he did it with both twins, to see whether there was some kind of genetic benefit that twins had that allowed them to live longer. Uh, he, he, he was not a nice guy. And this is my friend from, uh, my son Zach is here this weekend, and this is Ava Kaur from Terre Haute, not far from where you lived in Indiana before you got the wise motivation to move to Asheville closer to your dad. <laughs> but Ava, who just died a few years ago, um, not only wrote a book called Forgiving Mengele, which was very, very poignant and very, very, um, what's the word I'm going to look for here? Very disturbing to the Jewish community because they want to forgive anybody, right? And so she said, the only way I can get on with my life is to forgive Mengele. And so she did. What she did, she has a photograph there of, uh, of her sister and of her when the Soviet forces liberated Auschwitz. It was the Soviets, the Russians, who liberated Auschwitz uh, January 27th in, uh, in 45. So that is Eva Kor. Both she and her sister survived. But she became a friend and then spoke on the campus where I taught for over a quarter of a century. This is the kind of guy I really would not want my daughter to come and introduce to me as the person that she wanted to marry. Look at that face. But that is Julius Stryker, who would eventually be hanged in 1946 for his contributions to killing uh, so many people. But he was the editor of a publication called uh, The Sturmer, that is the Stormer, the Striker, the Attacker, which really had a, a hundreds of thousands of, uh, of subscribers, and for over two decades was an anti-Semitic newspaper. And if you remember what I said once from Mein Kampf, where Hitler said the Jew is really the devil in human form, well, guess what Julius Stryker also says? The Jew is a devil in human form. It's fitting that he be exterminated root and branch. And if you can see these two issues of the Sturmer, one on the left talks about ritual murder. We discussed that, right? We talked about anti-Semitism, the sense that Jews during the celebration of Passover kidnap children who are Christian 
and kill them, collect their blood, and use that in the manufacture of matzah bread, which is eaten during the Passover Seder meal. So ritual mort there, the ritual death on the left. On the right-hand side, it also has that similar kind of image of uh, Christian children being kidnapped and killed and their blood being used in the celebration of Pesach or uh, Passover. Uh, at the bottom it says, uh, the Jews are our misfortune. The Jews are our misfortune. And the publication there at, on the right talks about there being uh, a plan that the Jews have to dominate the world. Please remember that Hitler always believed that Jews were responsible for all of Germany's problems. And in addition, they were also going to take over the world. The server was not only available by subscription, it was also put on placards that were in the city so people could gather to read it. And there it's talking there with the uh, slogan at the top. Uh, we're with uh, Der Sturmer uh, against Judah, that is against Jews, and once again the familiar phrase, the Jews are our misfortune. The Jews are our misfortune. Well, there were other kinds of agencies and organizations that were going on that also furthered Hitler's agenda, and one of them was the Hitler Youth, the H.J., the Hitler Youth. Originated way back in 1922, became a paramilitary group in 1926, and from 36 to 1945, that period of uh, almost a decade, it was the only youth organization for boys in Germany. Boy Scouts and other particular groups were simply punctured by Hitler, and there you can see him with a bunch of this Hitler youth, and he's right in the center of the photo. I show you this particular picture because when I was teaching in Indiana, and my son will remember this person, he was a good friend of the family, librarian professor, he was actually the head librarian, Professor Vico von Strahlendorf. Vico was a member of the Hitler Youth. <laughs> One of the nicest persons I've ever known. Articulate, well-read, would do anything for you, such a pleasant person. And so when we got to be good friends, I said, because I knew this about Vico, that he was a member of the Hitler Youth, I said, why? Why, Vico? He said, it was the patriotic thing to do. And all my friends were in it. And you got rewards, and we went on hikes, and we played sports, and you got uh, medals and stuff for being proficient at things. He said it was really cool, it was really lots of fun. He just didn't know the purpose for which it had been founded. There was also an organization for girls, the League of German Girls, the Band of German Maidens, which, were, which became the only legal organization for young girls under Hitler. And the girls learned domestic duties, they learned how to be wives and, and mothers. And I think I said to you in a previous session that for Hitler, the idea was every woman needed to have seven children. We need to be able to increase the numbers of the Aryan race. If we do that, then we need more living space, and that's why he was looking east to Poland and Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union for living space. How about that statistic? 82% of the boys and girls belong to the Hitler Youth for Boys and the BDM for Girls in 1939. 1939 being the year that the war starts in September with the invasion of Poland. So 7.2 million members. Well, the last thing I want to share is why did they do it? What caused them to be these kinds of accomplices to Hitler? And I think there are several things that seem to run in common among them. And I'll talk about this and then we've got a chance to talk for 10 or so minutes before we need to adjourn for second service. First off, they did it because of land, a long-standing anti-Semitism. I mentioned to those of you who were able to attend on 
Wednesday evening that anti-Semitism is perhaps the, the longest hatred. The longest hatred. And it basically says, we hate Jews because they don't contribute anything. They only take away. They're less than human. They're responsible for every problem that we have. So if we're rid of them, we're rid of our problems. And by the way, they're, they're rats. They're less than human. They are intermention, subhuman. So like you get rid of rats to be able to clean up and purify your society, so we need to get rid of Jews. And, and my contention would be that when you start to place people in less than human categories, you can then be prepared to do very bad things to them. I'm going to say that again. When you put people in categories that are less than human, you can be prepared then to do very bad things to them. A quick example would be the genocide in Rwanda between the Hutus and the Tutsis. And they regarded the Hutus as being tall grass. Tall trees that needed to be cut down. So when you think of, of other human beings in ways that dehumanize them, that prepares you, I think, psychologically to be able to do bad things to them. So thinking of Jews as being lice, thinking of Jews as being rats, that was one way of psychologically being able to say, okay, now we can do bad things to them, because they're not really humans anyway. And Mengele, the doctor that I mentioned to you from Auschwitz, when they asked him, a doctor you know, who upholds the Hippocratic Oath to benefit people and be concerned about their house to do that, he said, well, they're not really human. They're Jews. So you can experiment on them because that will benefit the Aryan race. Second, jealousy and envy. We talked a little bit about this when I mentioned to you that for Jews, education was an act of worship. To be educated is to be worshiping God. And also being educated meant that certain professions were open, professions that were valued in the society, doctors and attorneys and so forth and so on, professors. And so Jews then had access to these particular professions before that was denied in Nazi Germany in 1935. So they felt they were safe, Jews did, and they were also worshiping God by the accumulation of the credentials to become those professions. They also did well in economically. So they were the object of envy and jealousy as well because they were attorneys and they were doctors and they were businessmen and they were bankers and they were professors. Third reason is, I think very importantly, the, the need for a scapegoat. You got problems? It's the Jews' fault. Anything's not good? It's the Jews' fault. My Jewish friends in Jefferson City, Missouri, where I used to live, we used to joke because the University of Missouri had a rather mediocre football team. They still have a rather mediocre football team. And When the Missouri Tigers were blues, my Jewish friends would send me a little note, all in play, saying, it's our fault. <laughs> it's our fault. <laughs> that was the relationship we had, so we could joke about those kinds of things, because they knew what had happened to them historically. You got a problem? Some Jew cost it. Religious fervor, also, the notion of Jews killed Jesus, it's payback time. Obscuring the fact that historically the Jews did not kill Jesus, the Romans did. Was there Jewish complicity among the temple leadership of the Sadducees? Absolutely. But did all Jews in the world somehow kill Jesus and therefore they deserve to be killed and beaten up and mistreated? No. But that was a very common perspective on Jews. The charge was deicide. That is, they killed God. They killed our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's Good Friday, and we're remembering the crucifixion of Jesus and his sacrifice for us, and we're bursting forth from the medieval churches, and we're looking for Jews. It's payback. 
They killed Jesus. And so, historically, if you look at Jewish history, they comment in Jewish history books that on Good Friday, Jews went into hiding. They didn't come out of their houses. They stayed off the streets because it was simply too dangerous to be out there. Very quickly then, Jews were an enemy that was easily discernible. Despite the poisonous mushroom, the poisonous mushroom was a publication that Julius Stryker did, the guy from Der, Der Sturmer, the editor. And this was a very popular book. And you know how if you are searching for mushrooms that are edible and that are poisonous, you better know which is which, right? I mean, even in parentheses, the, the Siddhartha uh, Gautama, the Buddha, uh, died because uh, his host one evening for dinner fed him the wrong kind of mushrooms. So, they look all the same, but some of them are poisonous. So the notion was, people may look the same out there, but the, jo the Jews are the poisonous mushrooms that you better come to recognize, right? So, they were an enemy that, despite the poisonous mushrooms, they said it's hard to detect them. They actually were able to be easily detected because of their appearance. And the more conservative the Jew, the more obvious the appearance, right? Even Orthodox Jews today, if you see them in airports, they have beards, they have curls down the side, right? They wear black hats, they wear black outfits, so they're identifiable. Uh, their diet, they're not going to enjoy my pork chops in applesauce ever. They speak a different language, right? Hebrew, or in Germany, it was a mixture of German and, uh, and Hebrew called Yiddish. They have religion, religious rituals that are different from ours. And then we'll just make sure we'll make them wear marks of distinction. Distinction not in a good sense, but distinction like we got a mark, right? Yellow stars. And that was not new in Nazi Germany. Throughout a number of centuries, different kind of identifying marks had been used. And what was Judith in German, or Jolt in Dutch, or Juit in French, they were known. Another thing, and this is important to know too, and it also helps explain sometimes why there were some people in the Roman Catholic hierarchy who seemed to assist some of Hitler's henchmen to escape. There was a bishop whose name was Alois Hudal, who helped some of these nasties find their way to South America. One might say, well, why? Because as bad as the Nazis were, they weren't commies. As bad as the, the, the Nazis were, they were not communists. And so there was this fear of a growing communist movement worldwide and in Germany. And in fact, Russia, Vladimir Lenin's grandfather was Jewish. Germany's Karl Marx was the son of Jewish parents. So, oh my goodness, these communists are Jews and those Jews are communists. So talk about a double hit. You're Jewish and you're in trouble and now you're, you're believed to be a, a communist. So that's a double kind of strike against you. So quickly, they also had small enough numbers that they were a non-political threat. Didn't have the numbers that were sufficient to be able to resist on the political front. And then lastly, I would say greed. Greed. The minute Jews were rounded up, their homes were vulnerable to theft. And so what did people do? They ran in and took stuff. Jews could take very little with them when they had to be uh, when they had to vacate the premises. And so now that stuff is left. And boy, they, they went after it like a feeding frenzy of fish. So I think if you take these particular things and you stir it all together, you get some of the rationale for why those persons did what they did. And, and, and why the most normally compassionate and sensitive of human beings would be persuaded to follow suit. If you fear things, and a leader plays on that fear, and makes you grandiose promises, and you're thinking, my God, it can't get any worse, it's got to get better, you tend to follow in line. You tend to follow in step. Goodness, I took more time than I thought I would. I apologize. But there are a couple minutes. 
And maybe you have a couple questions that could be asked, and I'll try to answer them. Please. Yeah, I understood that Adolf Hitler was going to be the same thing. Maybe the same as Schimmelgrober, if I'm not mistaken. Schimmelgrober. Schimmelgrober, and he was a wallpaper hanger. Uh, well, some folks say he did a number of rather menial jobs because he dropped out of high school at age 16. And he couldn't get into the army because he was viewed not to be uh, physically strong enough to do that. What he did do at times, he, he, he thought of himself as a really great artist. He really wasn't, but he, but he thought he was. And so he lived in Vienna, and he um, sold those kinds of postcards and other little prints to try to make money. Um, his, his dad, uh, who, who was not a nice guy, his, his dad was a nasty kind of dude and was abusive to Hitler, which only drove Hitler more toward his mom, um, uh, Clara, right? And when she died in uh, 19, uh, 1903, 1907, around that time, uh, Hitler was absolutely devastated. The, this, 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 this name, that was his father's name but he changed it to Hitler about 10 years before Adolf Hitler was born. So you're absolutely right. The original name was not Hitler, it was Schickelbrober. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Name again? Don't even ask me to spell that. I'll have to ask my, my friend Ashley, who's fluent in German, to do that. But Schickelbrober, yeah. S-C-H-I-C-K-E-L-G-R-O-B-E, -E, I think. That sound about right close. Close enough, close enough, close enough for, for jazz. Any other questions you'd, you'd like to I ask? Oh, oh yes, please. Paramilitary duties in the youth care. What were they doing in the oh. paramilitary? Did you hear his question? His question is, what kind of paramilitary duties did these youth do like in the Hitler Youth? Uh, they practiced uh, a combat. They also learned to use firearms. And they played war games. And here, here's one of the tragic things. As the war is coming to an end, and the, the, the demand for, for people on the front is really great, they start bringing in these kids that are 14, 15, 16, 17 years of age and put them on the front. That's how desperate they got. The postscript I'll add, though, is even amidst this military stuff, when the trains needed to be used to transport soldiers to the front, even young kids from the Hitler youth, you know what got the greater priority at the end of the war rather than the mass transport of troops? Getting Jews to the camps. And if you had a group of Jews that needed to be deported to Auschwitz in Poland versus getting some soldiers to the front, guess what the trains carried? The Jews rather than the troops, which indicates what? The incredible priority getting rid of Jews had to the very bitter end of the war. Well, we need to call a timeout, or I'm going to get in trouble with our pastor who says, you let those people go to get the second service. So, thank you very much for being here.